All right. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to UUSF Forum on this St. Patrick's Day. I think I see a few people wearing green out there showing their Irish pride. That's good. It's a beautiful day. In any case, we're glad that you came today. And we have a really good speaker for you today on a very important local issue. I'll introduce him in a minute. His name is Calvin Welch. Before we do that, just a business things I'll get out of the way. Uh, in case you haven't been here before, the restroom is just around the corner outside. If you aren't already receiving our emails about this, these programs, there's a sign-up sheet at the door, and feel free to sign that, and you'll get notified about these meetings in the future. Um, we have more good programming coming up for you between now and June. Next week, we have um, uh, Open Door Legal. So a person named Erwin Tertanati will speak about uh, this agency that provides legal services for indigent people, I believe mainly, that need help with their landlord disputes and things like that. Uh, the week af weekend at week after that, on uh, April 7th, we will have Professor Stephen Zunes from USF. He'll be giving us an update and his important perspectives on US foreign policy in the Middle East mainly. And a week after that, another professor from uh, San Francisco State, Anthony D'Agostino, will be talking to us about Russia and Ukraine. And then on April 21st, Jocelyn Lehrer will be speaking about masculinities, health, and social justice. And it's a program they've given elsewhere. I think it should be pretty interesting. I wanted to mention a kind of bit of a sad news is based on it. April 7th, we were planning to have a large gathering in this room. We may still do it, uh, a fundraiser for the Janine Freedom Theater, which is a theater company in the Janine refugee camp in the occupied West Bank. It's a great charity. Uh, so we plan to have one of their staff, a, a guy that is a theater person, come in here and kind of do a show a little bit and talk about the theater, which does really important work. But sadly, he has been denied the permission to leave the West Bank by uh, the Israeli government. So we're trying to decide what to do about that. We may still have the meeting with him presenting online. It won't be as great, but we may still do that. So we'll be messaging about that if you uh, want to wait for that to happen. Uh, what else? Uh, you know, in, t in terms of how we do this meeting, questions at the end, please uh, write them on the cards. I'll, I'll be monitoring Zoom over here while Calvin is speaking, and uh, we'll do the questions mainly at the end, probably in around 40 minutes from now. And uh, then I'd just like to mention sort of like how we operate in here. Our, our agreement is uh, the, our intention for this presentation is to hear about various issues of our world today and provide a safe space where many ideas can be heard and discussed in an atmosphere of dignity and respect for all participants. Therefore, here are our expectations about this conversation. Please do not use language which may be interpreted as, as demeaning to the speaker, or the audience, or other groups. Do participate by raising your hand to be recognized and identify yourself by name. There are cards available for you to write a brief question and state your opinion. Listen to and respect other points of view. Once you have spoken, let others have a chance to speak. And if there is time, you may be called upon to speak again. So now I'd like to welcome Willard Chin, who will do our Ohlone land recognition. Thank you, Jeff. <clears throat> we, the first Unitarian Society of San Francisco, acknowledge that our community is located on the unceded ancestral homeland, the Ramatusha Ohlone, the original inhabitants of the San Francisco Peninsula. We recognize that we benefited from living and working here, and we affirm their sovereign rights as first people. These were the original people of the land. And it's really important to acknowledge that there is a movement of people trying to reacquire the land that they lost. And you may have heard that the city of Berkeley is selling land to indigenous land trusts. So there is some leadership and descendants of the Ohlone people that are actively pursuing, you know, retaining the land and also protecting it and creating, you know, space for gathering of indigenous people. Thank you, Willard. Okay, now I'd like to introduce our speaker today. 
Calvin Welch. Mm. I first encountered him uh, by reading his articles on 48 Hills, which I thought were really insightful, giving a perspective about our affordable housing crisis, which, let's be frank, is a huge problem in San Francisco, one that lies at the root of many other social problems that we have, in my opinion. And um, I just thought he was a really brilliant thinker on this topic. I guess he's been writing on in other forums and talking about this for years. He is the former past director and board president of the San Francisco Info Clearinghouse, which is an advocacy organization for affordable housing and other equitable policies in their city. He founded the Community Housing Orgs, CCHO, and served on various task forces on affordable housing and living wages. So I'd like now to introduce to the podium, Calvin Welch. I'm going to uh, try to uh, address a, uh, a complex problem that is made more complex uh, by the players, if you will, in the game. It's really not that complex, uh, but uh, uh, let me try to address some uh, a, a kind of a factual basis upon which uh, my very brief remarks regarding what we can do about affordable housing will follow. The first and important uh, uh, task is to understand the term affordable housing is itself uh, 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 an area of dispute. It is both a popular term and a technical term. It is defined in federal statutes, state law, and city ordinances uh, as affordable housing. And uh, uh, we will be talking about that today. Uh, and I will try to demystify uh, uh, some of the points around the issue. The difficulty is, as I said, it is both a popular term an advertising term, housing developers uh, 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 refer to their projects as affordable housing uh, uh, without any real regard to the legal definition of affordable housing. All of the definitions reside around two important uh, uh, parts. Uh, uh, first is uh, the assumption is made that no household, no individuals should spend more than 30% of their gross income for housing. Uh, so the first definition of affordable housing is that it is affordable, uh, that uh, you not spend more than 30% of your total household income for housing. The second, right, realizing that household income varies, uh, there is a definition, and we'll see it uh, applied here in one of the slides, to the area that we're talking about. Uh, uh, it is referred to as an area median income, or in the business, AMI. Uh, 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 and uh, very low income housing is defined as housing able to be afforded by people earning no more than 20% of the average median, of the area median income, paying no more than 30% of their total income for housing. And that goes all the way up uh, to people earning up to 120% of median, which is referred to as moderate income housing. Uh, so th the definition of affordable housing is defined by what portion of your income and what your income is. Uh, and and uh, 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 with that understanding, that's the official definition of affordable housing, uh, not the popular definition. So first, let's understand the housing market that we're dealing with, which is San Francisco. Uh, 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 there are 413,000
thousand units. The documents that I'll be using today are all city documents. This is from a thing, a, a annual publication called the Housing Inventory, done by the Department of City Planning each year, each April. Uh, uh, so next month there'll be the the uh, 2023 housing inventory. And uh, next slide, please. Uh, as we can uh, uh, see, by building type, uh, 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 we have uh, of that uh, 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 number, about 122,000 of the units in San Francisco are in single family homes. That is predominantly the Western half of the city. Uh, 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 it houses the majority of families with children. It also houses a significant portion of seniors uh, uh, in San Francisco. The next uh, largest uh, number of units uh, are buildings of two to four units. Generally, those <clears throat> uh, those buildings are uh, oftentimes on the corners of uh, uh, um, buildings in the Richmond, in the Inner Sunset. Uh, um, um, uh, there are 84,000 such units in San Francisco. Uh, then there are buildings of five to nine units. In San Francisco, about 39,000 units are, are in buildings of five to nine units. And in buildings of 10 to 19 units, there are 18,000 units. But the largest, of course, are in buildings of 20 units or more, uh, of which there are 127,000 units. So let's keep this in mind. San Francisco is not a low density city. San Francisco is a city in which most people live in non-single family homes. Most people live in very big buildings. Indeed, San Francisco is the second most dense city in the United States a city of over 100,000. Uh, the most dense city is, of course, New York. And I'm making this point because uh, there is a, a official policy of the uh, Breed administration that density should be maximized in San Francisco because we don't have enough buildings big enough to accommodate the housing needs of the city. It is important to understand that if density alone produced reasonably priced housing, then the two most dense cities would be the two cheapest cities to live in, New York and San Francisco. In fact, they are the two most expensive housing markets in the nation. So there's a fundamental disconnect here. As we see, San Francisco is a heavily dense city with the vast majority of people living in buildings of five units or more with the largest number living in, 20, in buildings of 20 units or more. If density lowered prices by themselves, then everybody should be just fine. Does it work that way? Next slide, please. The other thing that we hear is that San Francisco has an aberration against producing housing. Only one county in the Bay Area since 1970 has increased its housing stock every year. And that one county is San Francisco. We produce more housing than any other county in the Bay Area and have for years. Here is a rest. Uh, uh, we will see that since uh, 2005, we have produced 49,000 units in San Francisco. 
not a piddly number and not a number that demonstrates an inability to approve projects, an inability caused by community opposition of NIMBYs or anybody else. Uh, uh, we have built more housing faster than our population has grown, a fact not often mentioned in San Francisco. But this listing shows uh, that we don't have much of a problem in producing housing per se. It's the price of housing that is the issue. Next slide, please. Table 25 is the number of affordable units that we have produced uh, between 2018 and 2022. Uh, uh, this is Mayor Breed's administration's playing some games with definitions and statistics. Inclusionary housing are those units required of market rate developers to include below market rent units. In San Francisco, that is now about 10% in buildings of eight units or more. 10% of the buildings now have to be below market rate. Below market rate does not mean affordable. In the second or first highest cost housing market, you can produce a unit that is below market rate, but still unaffordable to the vast majority of San Franciscans, especially San Franciscans of low or moderate income. The 100% affordable units these 3,106 units are the most affordable units. They are all affordable to particular categories of income levels uh, based upon uh, uh, the development program that year or uh, uh, subsequent years of the administration in power at City Hall. Uh, 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 ADU units are uh, uh, auxiliary uh, dwelling units that are allowed to be built in uh, uh, existing buildings on existing lots. This is a market-based solution uh, uh, to, quote-unquote, affordable housing, and are only affordable in the sense that they must be rent-controlled. And for those of you who know how rent control works in San Francisco, it is a restriction on the market increase allowed uh, by a, a rent controlled unit. That is to say, these are market prices, but the amount that you can raise them each year is limited uh, uh, based upon the CPI, the growth of the uh, uh, CPI. So it is possible to be living in a rent controlled unit that is in fact not an affordable unit to low income people, very low income people, even moderately income people. So playing games with below market and rent controlled units and calling them affordable units, which the Breed administration does, tends to increase the number of affordable units that the mayor likes to brag about. Uh, when in fact, of these 6,000 units, only about half the 3,000 units in 100% affordable developments are in fact permanently affordable housing. Um, uh, the second, Table 26, indicates 
the cost of market rate housing in San Francisco. And as you can see, the average two bedroom unit uh, 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 fluctuates between four, uh, around $4,000 a month. Uh, uh, if we follow the definition of affordability that you spend no more than 30% of your income uh, uh, for housing a month, that means it's affordable to people earning about $12,000 a month. That is not the majority of San Franciscans. That's not close to the majority of San Franciscans. So the majority of San Franciscans spend 50, 60, 70% of their total income for rent. As you can see, the, the cost of uh, 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 in uh, uh, for sale units in, in San Francisco priced them at a level now, they're at $1.5 million, priced them at a level that, not, that no one but the top 8% of San Franciscans can afford in the official definition of affordability, not spending more than 30% of your total income for housing costs. Uh, uh, so we live in a very highly uh, uh, competitive, if you will, market-based rent. And, and let's be clear about how the market works. If you do not have enough money to pay $4,000 a month rent, you're not in the rental housing market. If you don't have enough money to, to buy a, a home or a, a condo for $1.5 million, you're not in the market. The market simply is that grouping of people that can effectively afford the price. So we have a substantial portion of San Franciscans who are basically priced out of the housing market. Next slide, please. This is uh, the definition of affordability using San, Franciscan, uh, San Francisco's area median income. And it's, it's, it's an overstatement. Uh, uh, the metropolitan statistical area, which the Department of Housing and Urban Development, who's in charge of coming up with these numbers, uses, includes, San Francisco with San Mateo and Marin counties. So the standard metropolitan statistical area of San Francisco includes the two most wealthy counties in California, which has a tendency of raising the AMI at the disadvantage of San Franciscans. Nonetheless, that is the system that we live in. And um, uh, we, we then have over uh, the affordable housing production based upon those income levels. San Francisco has produced uh, between 2018 and 2022, 350 units able to be afforded by people earning 30% of AMI. Let me give you an example. A person who is on social security in San Francisco, in which social security is the principal form of their income, in AMI terms is earning 8% of AMI. 8%. We don't even build housing able to be afforded by people earning 8% of median. 
the lowest we go is 30% of median. And we don't build very many units of that. Very low income are people earning 50% of median or below, which is a large portion of the service sector in San Francisco. These are the working poor people that service our meals and, and clean hotel rooms. Uh, uh, we build about uh, 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 three, 350 units a year uh, of those units. And in that period, 18 to 22, we built uh, 2,100. This breaks it down by bedroom size and household size in terms of what we are able to build in San Francisco as affordable housing. As you can see, a studio able to be afforded by people with an income of roughly 30,000 goes for $655 a month. That's about as cheap as we can produce housing in San Francisco using the current system. How is that done? It's done, keep in mind, there is no such thing in San Francisco as affordable land. There's no such thing in San Francisco as affordable architects. No geotechnical engineer works at minimum wage. No carpenter works, a unionized carpenter in San Francisco works at anything but market rates. There's no sheetrock that is affordable. There's no timber that's affordable. There's no concrete that's, we have to pay market prices for all of the ingredients, the land, the labor, and the materials to produce the housing. And as more and more high priced housing is built in San Francisco, the higher land costs, labor costs, and material costs grow. So the way in which we produce housing able to be afforded by someone earning $30,000 a year is to have an entity, government, sometimes foundation, sometimes trade unions, actually donate, subsidize the difference between what a low-income person can pay and what the cost of the unit is. Currently, it costs about set. <clears throat> $700,000 in subsidy to produce a two unit apartment in San Francisco of about 1300 square feet, about 700. That's an incredible amount of money. People say that's, in, that's just incredible. Except remember that the deal that you do when you produce an affordable housing unit in San Francisco is you guarantee that price for 50 years or the life of the building. So if you amortize $700,000 over 50 years, it's the best housing deal you can get in San Francisco. It's a big upfront cost, but that's the only way permanently affordable housing can be built. You have to have a source of subsidy that is not the occupant of the building to cover the costs of development. And as I say right now, that's in round numbers, about $700,000 a unit that lasts 50 years. The regional government, as required by state law, establishes a regional housing need assessment for each county in California. 
these are called the, the, the magical musical term RENA, R-H-N-A. And each county has a set of requirements based upon its past housing production, its projected population growth, its current population characteristics uh, 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 on how many units over an eight-year period need to be built by income level in that area. And this is the RENA numbers just completed in 2022 uh, uh, in San Francisco. So you'll see that above moderate, that means market rate, uh, uh, the goal was to produce 12,536 units. We in fact produced 19,000 market rate units for some 152% of the goal. But when you get to the affordable sector, you see moderate income units, 80 to 120% of median, we only produced about 58% of the needed numbers. Low income, because of the insistence of the San Francisco affordable housing development community, we target lower and very low income folks in San Francisco. We built 61% of the goal for uh, uh, low income and 56% of the goal for very low income in San Francisco, more than any other county in the Bay Area. We are producing more affordable housing in San Francisco than any by far than any other county in San Francisco. Yet, we still fall about 50% short of the need. So we produce 153% of our needed market rate units, but only about 50% of the needs, 60% of the needs, 55% of the needs for the affordable housing units. Next slide, please. So this is what we've produced. This is the new RENA numbers. As you can see, they are an astounding increase. Never before in the history of RENA, and this is the seventh six-year period of, of RENA requirements, has there been such a dramatic increase in housing requirements. 82,000 units are to be built in San Francisco between 2023 and 2030. Virtually every expert, every practitioner understands that's an impossible task. That will not happen. The annual target is to produce 10,000 units a year in San Francisco. We've never produced 10,000 units a year. The most we've ever produced is high 5,000s, is half that. Most often we produce about 3,000 units a year. So why the extraordinary number? Because of a shift in state law led in large measure by our governor, former mayor, and our state senator, Senator Weiner, that says if you don't meet the RENA goals, then approvals of, develop, of uh, housing proposals become automatic, no public hearing, no environmental review. They are simply approved if you don't meet the RENA goals. Well, as, as we saw in the previous eight year period, we more than met the market rate requirements. We built 
meaning that the only ministerial approvals would have occurred for affordable housing. Not so with the new numbers. The new numbers, impossible to meet, will mean that after the first four years, when we fail to meet these goals, all future approvals of market rate development will occur without public hearing, public participation, or environmental review. Think of that. Next slide, please. This is the pipeline. This is, this is what we've already approved in San Francisco. Let me see if we can adjust the, if we can move up a little bit on that slide. We have 73,000 units. Remember our total goal is 82,000 units. We've already approved 73,934 units of which more than half, 34,000, are in major development sites that are enumerated below. These are all market rate developments. There's very little affordable housing in these projects. Yet they have been approved, but not built. We don't get credit for that. The law that has been changed says that we only get to count actual units that are built, even though the city does not build housing. The private sector builds housing. Yet the public sector will be penalized if the private sector doesn't build housing at a rate that most experts agree is an impossible rate. It's a rigged system. Nothing happens if we don't build the affordable portion. It only happens if we don't build the market rate portion. And we will never build the market rate portion. We've already approved 74,000 units that have not yet been built. Next slide, please. The state has defined San Francisco in an area that says part of the city, half of the city, is uh, uh, highest and high resourced based. That is to say, if a low income person, I mean, it, this is just bizarre. If a low income person lived in Pacific Heights, they would be living in a neighborhood that has a high ability to meet their educational, health, and social needs. That's, a, that's an odd metric. But nonetheless, that is the map of the high and highest resources areas for low-income people. It's basically the center and western half of the city. Next slide, please. This is a map of all of the area plans that the city has devised over the last 25 years. Notice where there is no neighborhood planning. The high resource neighborhoods. So there is no generalized plan about how 
living and working in a particular neighborhood can be facilitated by public action in the center and western part of the city, with the exception of the western shoreline. And the western shoreline area plan is basically an environmental plan. It's basically how do we manage sand dunes? Uh, uh, but uh, 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 the Balboa Park uh, 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 station plan deals with the 800, 1200 units that's to be built on the old uh, 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 disused uh, water system site adjacent to City College. Bayview Hunters Point, Show Place Square, the Mission, these are all areas of the city that are in deep need of assistance and have devised plans that include housing in context of neighborhood commercial development and employment opportunities for residents. That does not exist in the western half of the city. The western half of the city, next slide please, that will be the subject of the greatest rezoning in the history of San Francisco. This is the proposal of London Breed's planning department released earlier this year, showing the areas of the city that will be dramatically increased in density because the mayor's administration believes that if you create dense housing, market forces will over time, through a concept of filtering, produce affordable housing. Literally, the mayor argues that the way we house homeless San Franciscans is to allow the development of $2 million condominiums. Because over time, people who live in older houses in San Francisco will move to the new $2 million condominiums, freeing up the older units, which will then magically drop in price so that homeless people can afford them. And if you believe that notion, then you're more uh, credulous than I am. Everybody knows in San Francisco that old houses don't decrease in value, they increase in value. That the highest and most expensive use uh, excuse me, that the highest and most expensive buildings in San Francisco are 150-year-old Victorians. It is absurd to believe that this concept, which is an academic concept called filtering, actually works in a high-income, red-hot real estate market. But that's the line. So next slide, please. Freddie Mac is the federally subsidized entity that issues mortgages in the United States. Freddie Mac did a study of filtering and whether or not it actually works. And what this rather obtuse graph shows is that in high income, high uh, uh, real estate markets, filtering doesn't reduce housing costs. Filtering actually increases housing costs. And that's what this graph shows. Of the 10 markets where the largest increase in occupational income has occurred, six of them are in California. 
And that's what's happening in San Francisco. In fact, instead of dropping about 1% a year, which is the formulation used by, for example, the Yimbis, when they defend high density market rate development, well, it, it, it will free up units that, that, that will drop in price by about 1% a year. In fact, in San Francisco, according to Freddie Mac, it increased about 0.7% a year. So in a 40 year period, there's a 33% increase in older homes. So the, 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 the basic notion that the way in which mar the market will produce affordable housing filtering doesn't work given the conditions of San Franciscans. So what is to be done about all of this? One, stop doing stupid things. End the policy of increasing residential density for market rate units, which simply drives up the cost of housing, which makes acquiring sites for affordable housing even more expensive. Reform the agencies of government that issue building permits, principally all of which are governed by the mayor's office, second, address the needs of San Franciscans who need housing in a holistic way. The maddening thing about the Yimby argument is, if you believe their argument, a neighborhood is made up only of housing. There are no schools, there are no parks, there's no transit, there's no commercial real estate core, there's no retail businesses, there's no employment, there are no services. It's only housing. That's not how people live. Any meaningful attempt to address the housing crisis in San Francisco has to deal with the fact that we are either the most or amongst the top 10 most income maldistributed cities in the United States, in a nation that has the highest income incongruity of any major capitalist system. We have to address people's full needs for services, education, occupation, work, and housing. That's how we begin to create policies that quit doing stupid things. Thirdly, identify and fund the necessary subsidies to produce new affordable housing. That means at the national level, at the state level, and at the local level. There will be in November, quite possibly, a regional bond of $10 billion that begins to address the regional need for affordable housing, but it doesn't go far enough. Finally, engage opportunities to involve people, existing residents, in developing sites and locations for new affordable housing. Create a planning process that does not pit existing neighbors against new neighbors, but joins new neighbors, the need for housing, with existing residents' need for transit services, 
support better schools, better parks, better police services, and figure out a way to meet the needs of both populations in a common planning process that does not pit one side of San Francisco against the other. That's my simple solution. Be happy to answer any questions. Um, do the rights accorded to future by San Francisco contribute to the scarcity of available st stock, which could be offered as affordable? I, I'm, I'm not sure I understand the question. <clears throat> do the rights according to renters, I'm sorry, oh. by San Francisco contribute to the scarcity of available stock, which could uh, be uh, uh. offered as affordable? I, I don't know. I don't believe so. I don't believe that uh, 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 San Francisco landlord-tenant law is so oppressive as to reduce affordable housing opportunities. Indeed, <clears throat> one of the strategies that works very well in San Francisco is working with tenants in figuring out ways of buying their own building and creating what is called a community land trust. Uh, 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 my personal bias is the the key is moving uh, as much of the housing stock uh, off the housing market as we can uh, through either nonprofit ownership uh, uh, or uh, 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 resident ownership um, instead of uh, uh, investor ownership. So no, I don't believe that tenants' rights in San Francisco impinge upon the ability to produce affordable housing. Thank you. Does Treasure Island here, does Treasure Island have the potential to solve this with so much land? Uh, in one of the slides that I showed you, Tre Treasure Island is is listed. It's, it's one of those market rate development uh, uh, areas I believe Treasure Island is slated for somewhere around 13,000 units. Uh, yeah, I think Treasure Island could be part of the solution. The difficulty with Treasure Island is sea level rise. Um, uh, Treasure Island is going to be underwater in another 30 years. Um, and there will be extraordinarily expensive uh, and kind of uh, uh, Herculean efforts required uh, to build a seawall uh, to keep Treasure Island. Remember, Treasure Island is a man, human made island. Uh, um, and uh, it is, uh, it's sinking slightly as sea level rise is happening. It's an unfortunate situation. So yes, Treasure Island could be part of it. It's going to be an expensive part of it, but it could be part of the solution, yes. Okay, here's another one. What are the potentials for obstacles to the creation? What are the potentials or obstacles to the creation of affordable housing and buildings, especially commercial ones like downtown, uh. I guess? that are now empty and abandoned. Right. Um, <clears throat> there are some commercial office buildings uh, that lend themselves uh, to being uh, transformed into housing. Uh, the, the difficulty is it's not going to be inexpensive. Um, uh, the, the basic... Uh, floor plan of an office building uh, is a column free space um, um, that is unobstructed across the entire floor. That's either one really big unit uh, um, uh, or you have to subdivide that building with the interior portion of that floor having no sunlight. The second major problem is utilities. Um, uh, generally, office buildings have one, perhaps two stacks for uh, sewage and uh, bathrooms. 
uh, uh, that has to be uh, uh, addressed. That's not a cheap issue to address. So the, it, 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 there are possibilities, but I think they're much more limited than we would otherwise think. Uh, but it is a possibility uh, to use uh, um, uh, office buildings for residential development, although I don't think it's going to address uh, the broad needs that we do have. But it will bring people downtown, which is critically important to revitalizing downtown. And so should be sought uh, uh, anyway for the impact that it will have on creating a revitalized downtown. Our, our problem is that we basically define downtown as a nine to five work location. And uh, uh, we need to redefine downtown to being more of a community, a neighborhood that has a residential population. Do our current policies encourage professional investment companies or very wealthy persons to invest, making it a huge profit, making a huge profit over 10 to 30 years and driving prices up even further? Yes. Yes. Um, I don't know, folks may have read the New York Times story day before yesterday that the American Association of Realtors has finally admitted that their uh, monopoly on the buying and selling of real property actually drives housing prices up and have agreed to make a payment of a half a billion dollars. Uh, uh, what changes in their policies they're going to do, I don't know. But if you take a look at the entire, uh, I'll, I'll use the word capitalist real estate market, it is designed, it has been concentrated and de is designed to basically work uh, uh, as a safe place to bank money. So we have this interesting situation in California now, a principal purchaser of single family homes, which are all slated to be dramatically increased in allowable density are investment firms from Wall Street. They're not mom and pop. They're not families. They're investors who are playing the money game on buying cheap and selling dear. That's how capitalism works. And to the degree that we take as many housing units as possible off that market, the better we will be. And that means by helping organizations, helping businesses, excuse me, helping uh, tenants, helping landlords make investments in community land trusts or other forms of communal ownership in which the ownership is the people who live in the building. So yes, the answer, in my opinion, is you bet. I mean, maybe as much as a third of the units. I mean, haven't you ever noticed downtown the the, the condo towers that were built in the uh, early 2010s at night? are dark, people don't live there. That's investment. That's a place to park your money. And, and nothing in the mayor's proposal over this high density development bans that. We tried to get uh, 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 super uh, a, a, a proposal before the Board of Supervisors that would allow the increase in every single family home district in San Francisco to build four units. We tried to ban investor ownership. The proposal, uh, 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 the, the supervisor who made the proposal uh, 
the chair of the land use committee, refused the request, refused to make the amendment. Uh, there is no question that a good portion of the units uh, 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 being proposed in this high density scheme will be investor owned. Nothing prohibits it. This question follows up on that, I think. How do we deal with held off units held off the market by owners who don't want to deal with rent control? Can they be compelled to rent? I mean, right. how can they do that? Uh, two years ago, three years ago, uh, a ballot measure was placed on the ballot by my supervisor, Dean Preston, uh, that uh, will charge uh, um, uh, uh, residential buildings that are held vacant for more than four years that will charge them a tax. Uh, uh, this has also been done uh, by Supervisor Peskin uh, uh, around commercial property, uh, commercial property that is held off the market uh, for long periods of time until generally the absentee owner uh, gets the price they want. So yes, that's a very real issue. It needs to be made much more uh, difficult to purposefully hold uh, uh, a residential building uh, off the market. Uh, uh, the estimates are hard to, to uh, determine accuracy, but it's been estimated that as many as 20,000 units in San Francisco are purposefully held off the market uh, uh, for, for a variety of reasons. But there, there may be as many as 20,000 uh, residential units. Um, and now we're getting into more policy questions. What policy changes are possible in San Francisco in the foreseeable future, and will the um, upcoming elections affect any of those policies? And what what do you know about them so far? Uh, yeah, there there probably will be a measure on the ballot uh, in November uh, banning the demolition of rent-controlled units. Uh, um, a significant portion uh, of the areas that I showed you that are scheduled for high density development include rent controlled units. And uh, uh, rent controlled units are the cheapest units in the city uh, to buy and sell because of rent control. They are not attractive uh, to investors because of rent control. Uh, um, and so uh, there's a, a real market uh, proclivity to buy and demolish, especially if you're going to be allowed to build two, three, four times the number of units that are in the existing building. So the, the notion is uh, uh, that if we can figure out a way to ban demolitions, of sound rent control buildings, not of course of, of buildings that are uninhabitable, but uh, sound rent control buildings, that that will uh, 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 save that, that housing stock. I believe that uh, with Aaron Peskins entering the race, that we will now see a major debate over housing policy. I think that debate will dominate uh, the mayor's race from now to November. Uh, so I think uh, uh, we're going to hear a lot more about housing. Aaron is going to be called the anti-housing supervisor because he has not supported the unlimited development of high-density market rate housing. And that's what it's going to be about. If you believe the mayor, if you believe the Yimbis, that the way you produce housing able to get people in the tenderloin off the streets is by building more hundred uh, uh, two million dollar condos, 
uh, uh, because through the, the magic of the marketplace called filtering, even though Freddie Mac shows it doesn't work and works exactly the other way in San Francisco, then you're going to be uh, 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 a supporter of the mayor. If you believe that it doesn't work that way, that there are other alternatives, then I think you ought to give Supervisor Peskin a close look. And we're very interested in policy here. So <clears throat> this is not an election question, but uh, has Aaron Peskin actually declared that he's going to run for no. mayor? Uh, no, he's in the process of declaring that he's going to run for mayor. <laughs> so you think? Well, uh, Aaron is uh, uh, Aaron is no fool. Aaron understands that the minute he declares he is going to be the target of literally millions of dollars of attacks. And so his position has been, I'll wait to the very end to declare. He has until June 15th, I think, to declare. Um, where do most of the workers in San Francisco's huge service industry live? And what kind of housing conditions do they have if they live in San Francisco? Um, I'll be happy to uh, send to Jeff uh, for your guys' edification. A study done last year uh, by the Council of Community Housing Organizations and the San Francisco Labor Council that took a look at exactly that question. Uh, the overwhelming majority of service sector workers in San Francisco earn 50% of median income or below. Uh, uh, and they live uh, 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 generally in the eastern and southeastern portions of San Francisco, generally in um, uh, rental uh, uh, housing, uh, uh, generally of a household size. The average household size in San Francisco is 2.2 persons per household. It's the lowest density of any of the Bay Area counties. Uh, the highest is Solano County with about 4.5 persons per household uh, in Solano County. We have 2.2. Uh, it is generally recognized that uh, uh, people earning 50% of median and below live in households of four to six persons per household. Um, this questioner says, I believe I heard you say that increasing housing density increased unit costs. If I heard that correctly, can you please explain why that is true? <clears throat> Well, it's construction. Uh, it's, it all comes down to construction. A, a wood frame structure in San Francisco, uh, which is uh, usually ends at about four or five floors. You can't go much higher with wood frame. Uh, 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 pencils out to about... Uh, uh, seven, eight hundred thousand dollars a unit uh, uh, in construction costs, all in construction costs. Once you go above five floors, you get into steel frame construction. And steel frame construction is extraordinarily more expensive. Uh, uh, I, I don't believe I said uh, uh, and if I did, I misspoke. High-rise buildings are more profitable. High-density buildings are more profitable. They're not cheaper. They're more profitable because you can charge more for that view apartment on the 19th floor than you can a single family home in the Richmond. And, and that's why the effective market 
wants high density buildings. It's because they are extraordinarily profitable. It's not that the, the costs go up somewhat, but the prices go up dramatically higher. Um, this, um, this is a kind of an important question in the state, I know, but about the water, the water issues and where we get our water. Uh, regarding San Francisco, will we have enough water to serve all the new units we are planning to construct? Nobody knows. I mean, understand what Sacramento has been doing over the last five years. It's been increasingly requiring local governments not to do environmental review of new housing development. Indeed, Supervisor Wiener is proposing an ordinance that would exempt from environmental review all of the coastal zones in San Francisco. Uh, uh, nobody knows for sure, but, but it's not just water. How about power? How about insurance? Has anybody taken a look at what's happening to the insurance industry in California In what's happening to utility costs in California? No one, not the governor, who is in charge of a state government that supposedly manages both utility and insurance costs are in fact containing dramatic increases. California has seen over a 200% increase in utility costs in the last seven years. It is, the, the, the impact of uh, 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 new housing development in that context is not only water, but it's do we have enough electrical capacity? Do we have enough? Uh, 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 how is the state going to insure uh, uh, property, especially in those parts of the state that are subject to wildfire? No, it is, it is one of the great absurdities of the present policy debate that all we talk about is density and approvals. We don't talk about any, what about schools? Well, that's answered by there'll be no families. If we remove all the, the families with children, we don't have to worry about schools. Well, what about parks? Well, that that's maybe, what about transit? Do, do we really believe that the private automobile, even an electric automobile, is going to solve urban transit issues? We're not talking about doubling the capacity of Muni to Western San Francisco while we double the carrying capacity of the land. It's, it's insane what we do not factor in to this rather absurd insistence on high density market rate development. <clears throat> yeah, that's uh, environmental issues are really factor in here and I, we're, people rarely talk about them. All they talk about is rent and, rent and building more house, housing. And here's another question. Where does San Francisco stand regarding that question in regard to developing green buildings? Nowhere. We, we, we have no, uh, uh, we have no uh, uh, such requirement. I mean, we have the, the state building codes to the degree that the state building codes have been addressed uh, uh, by green concerns. We incorporate them, but we have no special. Uh, we've taken no special efforts. We've made no specific uh, or special efforts to uh, uh, do green. It's it's hard to do a 200-foot steel frame construction uh, uh, high-rise condo uh, uh, in an environmentally benign way. I mean, that that's just simply the reality. 
Is that it? I want to thank you very much. Thank you so much for your presentation, Kelvin. I thought that was really, really informative, and thank you for that. Please come back next Sunday. We will have Erwin Tertanati from Open Door Legal speaking. Then on the 30th, there won't be a forum, and the week after that, we will be back with Professor Stephen Zunes from USF talking about U.S. foreign policy in the Middle East. Thank you.